So, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Glenn. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining us here at Vine Evangelical Church in Seven Oaks this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who are thinking perhaps Glenn and I have had a disagreement already, I can assure you we haven't. We're observing, it's the 21st of May 2020. We are observing social distancing rules, that's why we're keeping a steady two metres uh, between us. So today we're here to ask Glenn, ask Pastor Glenn, some <laughs> questions about himself, his life and uh, the role of Christianity. And I think the best place to probably start with then, Glenn, is tell us about your life before you met Jesus Christ and, uh, you know, what eventually led you to, uh, to Christianity. Okay, I'll try and keep it brief, because uh, I could probably spend two weeks just talking about that. Um, before I was a Christian, I'll say some highlights, though, uh, that should bring it all together. I was, my family was, I suppose you could say, dysfunctional. Uh, grew up with various stepdads, uh, broken family. But we weren't churchgoers at all, but they, we were nominal Catholics. So I had some experience of church, but my belief in God, I had a conclusion. If God was real, he didn't care about me, you know, if he was real. So I wouldn't, I wasn't a God seeker. Okay. Also, I was quite rebellious, so in secondary school, I was only allowed in a quarter of the school that I went to. I was actually banned from two quarters of the school. And you so this two thirds of the school. Do you think this rebellious, rebellious nature came from, uh, as a result of your family background? It, it, there was a result. When, before my parents divorced, I remember they used to argue every night, and I was encouraged to pray every night for my dad. Um, my prayer was, Lord, if you are there, if there is a God, if you are real, keep my family together and of course when they split up I remember turning around and said and I said well you're either not real or if you are you don't care mm. and then I looked at my dad who was my role model and I thought well you're a hypocrite so what's the point so yeah I, I kind of thought well I might as well just do what I want to do where did your father get his belief from? Uh, Irish in descent a long line of Catholics, okay. so I'm Catholics. Yeah. So yeah, so I think he did have a belief, but how it worked out, I wasn't too sure. So in my character as well, you know, even now I'm, I'm not one to stay on post. I always like to explore and push boundaries. That's that's natural in me. So with no framework or moral guidance, I was gone, right. completely gone. Yeah. Um, at the age of 14, I was regularly in trouble with the police. Um, I think the first court conviction was for Bourbon, which was on a cricket pavilion. Then, around 14 to 16, I was drinking heavily, and then by 16, quite seriously into drugs, uh, which would have been from marijuana to heroin, but the main thing I liked was LSD, the kind of hallucinogenic drugs. So you went from alcohol at 14, I mean, where did you get this from? Did you, oh, were you, you shoplifting or were you...? Yeah, well, there's a couple of off-licenses that we found were quite an easy target. Okay. So between me and my friends, we could get crates of alcohol, right. quite easy to get. Right. Plus, I had friends who were slightly older than me as well, uh, 16 or 18, and they could just go and get whatever we needed. So, yeah. By the age of 19, um, I was arrested at gunpoint. So I was down in Dorset because it's also a very violent world I lived in. Again, to try and keep things short. Uh, over in Temple Hall, Dartford, I kind of grew up in Dartford, and I was in one flat when suddenly the door kicked through, all these men with balaclavas running, they was all tooled up. Dartford's just on the southeast edge of, uh, of London, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's first hand in Kent, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so all these boats about the clavers came in, there was me, a friend of mine, and a pregnant lady there. They punched the other two to the ground, and eventually I ended up with stitches in the back of my head. It, it was quite a violent world. So I moved down to Dorset to get away from all that, but soon realised wherever I went, trouble followed. Mm -hmm. So there was a problem there that I didn't see at the time, wherever I went. Right, so you moved to Dorset. Um, but you were still, you still had a drug ha habit, I Oh guess. yeah, yeah, my world, my it. world was drugs, hence I got arrested at gunpoint down in Dorset. Yeah, um, yeah. They thought it was the London-Dorset connection, but yeah. they just missed it. So, what should have been a serious drug conviction ended up just possession, so, yeah. 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 I suppose as well, before I was a Christian, I never took anything seriously. I, I can remember... Apart from the drugs. Apart from the drugs? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I was in a police cell down in Weymouth, and I was just laughing at them all. Uh, mainly because I knew they'd got it wrong. Their timing was so off. If they had been there a couple of hours earlier, they could have got the hall. Yeah. Instead, it was personal possession. So, of course, I, was, I knew it was a fight. I was getting away with this. So eventually they came into my cell and said, look, you've got to stop laughing, because I was literally shouting through the door. They said, we're going to interview you. So I said, I don't want the job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty much yeah. Yeah, yeah. how I was. That was your sense of humour at the time and yeah. uh, how you approached the situation. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, my sense of humour still needs redemption. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, we can probably forgive you for that. Um, so just tell us a little bit about I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that um, you know many of the people watching this may not have experience of drugs. I mean, this this sounds this sounds terrible. I mean, is it is it something that just takes you over completely? Or yeah, I was asked. I used to share my story quite a bit. Uh, schools, prisons, all sorts of places. And I can remember one teacher at this big secondary school. He turned around to me and said, "Did you enjoy drugs?" Mm. I said, "Well, I did it for seven years. Of course, I did." But I didn't realise there was other options, there was other worldviews. Because if people back then said to me, don't do drugs, well, I couldn't handle life anyway. Yeah. So that really was my world and all of my community. You know, we was in quite a close-knit community. To so stop doing that, well, for what? Yeah. Well, to carry on living, but without, <laughs> yeah. without the very thing that you live for. So I wasn't looking for a way out. I really yeah. wasn't. Um, so what happened then for you to find this way out then? What sort of led you to believing then that drugs were just not the right thing? Is all that like, what happened or...? God invaded my life. All I can say is one Sunday night that started off like many Sunday nights, my best friend then was uh, a practicing witch. She was a Satanist called Sally. Uh, she had a spiritual reality about her and that's what drew me to her. She, there was something about her that was so different. And she said, there's not just the physical world, there's the spiritual world. So I was really looking into that kind of era for answers. You know, I thought, this can't be it, there has to be more. So we were on an LSD trip together. With her, I got involved in the occult, I'd been involved in spiritism. And um, we went off on this tour. Uh, we visited the spiritualist church, it was shut. This was about 11 o'clock at night then. But we were kind of reminiscing about things. Mm -hmm. Then we ended up in this school field, and um, she said a few times she was recruiting me to this satanic cult that she belonged to, but I just took it all as a joke. You know, to me, everything was a joke. And then something happened. All I can say is, I wasn't expecting this, but I felt that everything I'd been playing with my whole life had come to a head. And I even saw it could have been the LSD, I was tripping at the time. But I saw these newspaper headlines and my name was at the top. And what went on was horrific. And I thought, that's my future, that, that's all I've got. And then when I looked at who I was and what my life was all about, I realised I was lost. And then I got this thought that if this God is real, because I'd experienced a lot of spiritual reality through Sally, which was not of God. And I thought, well, if Satan's real, that probably means God's real. Mm -hmm. And if God's real, that means I'm his enemy. If I'm his enemy, then I'm going to hell. It, suddenly the light came on. And I thought, what can I do about it? You know, I was, I was also known as a, a blasphemer. I remember um, in a pub I heard these people talking about Jesus and God. So I walked over there and just started taking the mic out of them. So, you know, that's the sort of person I was. I wasn't... I wasn't the sort of person a Christian would want to talk to, to put it lightly. Mm -hmm. So I did something that I never thought I'd do. I also had voices in me telling me to kill people. And, okay, I'd hurt a lot of people in my past. I wouldn't deliberately go out and murder people, but I was losing control, absolutely mm -hmm. losing control. So I did something I never expected myself to do. From inside, I cried out, if there's a God there, help me. But whereabouts were you now? Were you still down in Dorset or were you back oh, in Dorset? Oh, in Dartford. So back in Dartford, yeah. There was a lot of to and fro in yeah, my life. Yeah. Oh, it always was. Um, yeah, I was in Dartford. I was in a school field, which is now the West Kent Community College. It used to be Dartford West. So tell us more about this, this voice you've got, or this message right. you've got. How did, how did it manifest itself? Well, literally, I cried out, there's a God there. You know, I've got these feelings to kill people and seeing who I was going to go and kill and trying to suppress it. It was awful. Anyway, I cried out, there's a God there, help me. Yeah. 
Straight away as I was doing that, my friends, the Satan, started screaming. She was covering her head and screaming. I thought, what is going on? And then this other voice came in. It just came straight into my head and it said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I later found it in the Bible, actually. Right. Right. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I didn't know who the Lord was. Mm. But this peace came down. You know, it sort of came in. And I had this assurance that I was going to be saved. Well, saved from what? Saved from hurting other people. That was the first thing. And it, it was just turmoil. But all the time I bipped on today, and of course it got challenged. It, it was like, I could literally feel like, um, it's like being stuck in the middle of a storm when you can feel this power all around you and that everything was going on. And um, yeah, my friend was spinning and screaming as these God thoughts were coming in. So in the end, she took a run out of the field and I ran behind her. And all I can say is, that night was horrific. So this was just a, a thought that you had. It yeah. wasn't someone giving you a piece of paper with no. the words on it. It no. wasn't someone just, who, um, who, who, um, who preached to you, for want of a better word. No. It was just a thought that came into your mind. Yeah. Right. And of course, when I'm thinking of God and saved, this other voice, uh, their thoughts came in, but they were more like voices, yeah. said, how can you cry out to God? You. Yeah. Look at what you've said. Look what you've done. Look, I can remember my family Bible when I was about eight. I, and life was terrible. I went, yeah, there is a God. And I just tore it and threw it across the room. Yeah. I said, I never want to know a God like that. Yeah. You know. So for me to be doing that, I felt like the biggest hypocrite on the face of the earth. But I was too scared not to. So that night, eventually, I managed to go home and sleep. But because of the things I'd seen in the occult, these tormenting thoughts... We're saying, you've only got to think such and such will die, and they will. Yeah. So I'm trying to think, I can't think that. It was so you've got bad. voices coming from the occult, and you've yeah. got voices coming from God himself. Yeah, and also, to mix it all up, years of drug abuse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a good starting point. Oh. Yeah. Next day, all I can say is I woke up, and for the first time in my life, I felt guilty. I felt, the Bible calls it conviction of sin. I became very aware that I was sinful, absolutely sinful, and didn't know what to do about it. Mm. You know, all I could see is, well, I'm me, I, I can't change who I am, I can't change what I've done. And I thought, saved? I'm, I'm going to hell. And I just knew it. I had this absolute conviction that I was going to hell mm. and didn't know what to do about it. Mm. So I didn't become a Christian that night. What happens, because I didn't even think of Jesus, so I thought was everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I thought the name of the Lord was God, I didn't know it was Jesus at that point. So I'm praying, I didn't realise it was praying, I was, alright God, if you're real, I need a sign, I need to know who you are, where to go, what to do. I was absolutely lost. Yeah. So I couldn't go to my friends, because they was either into the alcohol or drugs, that was it, that was my friendship base. I couldn't go to my family, because I tried to protect them from my lifestyle. Um, I was with a violent stepdad at the time as well, so there was no help there. I couldn't really go to anyone. So I spent two weeks shut off in my room crying out, if you're real, if you're real God, who are you? Yeah. Then, uh, it was a Monday night, there was a knock on my front room door. And it was an old friend of mine, known him for years. And he said, where you been? I haven't seen you for weeks. And he said, uh, we've got some drugs come, come down, you know, let's go and try them out. So I said, yeah, okay. So we ended up at another friend's house to basically sample the wares. You know, we were salesmen at the end of the day. Yeah. And in my friend... So this was two weeks after... Two weeks after, yeah. Your experience in the field where you'd had this message. Yeah, yeah. I would literally couldn't come out. I was, I was messed up, yeah. absolutely messed up, crying out, if you will, God. Um, anyway, went out that night, I was with my friends. My plan was just to get absolutely stunned and try and switch the brain off. Uh, there was LSD there, I was offered LSD, free of charge, this was sampling, and I actually turned around to my mate, I, I, called, him, I called him Adam, you know, I don't know. Um, he said, got some acid, what do you think? I said, I'm not having it. And he went, what? Are you sick or something? I went, yeah, for me to turn down drugs was a biggie. I said, uh, yeah, something like that. Had you had drugs for those two weeks that you'd stay mm, locked at? The... Only marijuana. Right. To me, that was, you know, I'd always had my personal, I'd smoked that like people smoke cigarettes then. Yeah. So I couldn't remember a day without that for 
Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that night, my friends, there were four of us in his flat, uh, three of them on LSD, and me just smoking marijuana. And funny thing is, this documentary came on about witchcraft. Mm. And I'm calling him Adam, that wasn't his name, but he turned around and said, uh, oh, you're in this, isn't you? I said, used to be, I wouldn't touch that now. And he said, not doing LSD, not looking at this stuff, are you the real Glenn Walsh? What's happened to you? Yeah, and I went, What's happened to you, Glenn yeah. Walsh? And I was just said, I'm not in a good place, you know, and so I'll just have a puff and I'll be quite happy with that. Then, of course, I'm still thinking, if one calls in the name of the Lord and give me a sign, and I'm just sitting there, and suddenly, I just looked at his living room door, and I was asking for a sign. Didn't know where it was going to come from. In the grey wood, now, I used to have photos of this, but I've lost them, this is 30 odd years ago. On the door, in the grey wood, as clear as anything, you, you can even see the detail of two eyes, a face with a beard, yeah. a crown of thorns and a cross above it. Yeah. And I looked and I thought, that looks like Jesus. Yeah. So of course I've gone out and pointed it out to these and they went, yeah, it's the trip, we're all tripping. They went, well, that's freaky. I said, I'm not tripping. Anyway, I looked at it and it was the other side of the door. It was actually the pattern of the grain of the woods. And I'm looking at it and thinking, Jesus, that really looks like Jesus. And then another download. And it said, Everybody who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. And I thought, I'm asking for a sign, I'm seeking, there's a door, and it's showing me Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So suddenly I thought, God, are you Jesus? Jesus, are you God? And suddenly I started obsessing about this Jesus character. Um, I'd say that was probably the time I became a Christian, or a Jesus follower. Yeah. Although my doctrine then was absolutely way off, because yeah. I'd never read the Bible. Um, hadn't been to church since I was made to go to Catholic church as a child. You know, even then, if I could get out of it, I would. So I had no understanding of the gospel of anything. But all I knew was Jesus is the way to God. Although it was mixed with all these other systems of beliefs I had. And you felt this despite, if you don't mind me saying so, Glenn, and I feel safe because you're two metres away from me, <laughs> but you're a pretty bad lad, really, weren't I you? Was, I mean, you, yeah. were, um, you, you were not sort of like being helpful to people, no. you were stuffing as many bad chemicals in your body as possible, yeah. you broke the law, you were hurting other people. Yeah, yeah, and um, didn't care. This was the thing, when I'm saying that night, the next day I, felt, I woke up feeling guilty, I didn't used to do guilt, it didn't bother me. Yeah. You know, I think there was probably something psychologically wrong with me back then. Yeah. But yeah, my brother, you know, they used to call me Mad Dog. That was a nickname they gave me, because I never had any remorse. Yeah. You know, I, I, and I'd pick on people's weaknesses. You know, yeah, a lot of violence, a lot of this, a lot of that. But going back to that night, I kept thinking Jesus, and it wouldn't go away. So suddenly, there was um, a glimmer of hope. This Jesus, well, who is it? How's he going to save me? I didn't understand the gospel, didn't get it, didn't know it. But I just kept thinking, Jesus is going to save me. That's all I could think. Then I became obsessive with those thoughts. So I turned Are we talking a, a hours, days, weeks, months between that night and how you're describing your feelings at the moment? Instantly and ongoing. Okay. <laughs> as yeah. soon as I saw it, it's like Jesus hit me. So I ended up the following Sunday, while my friend was in his flat eating dinner, turning up with a camera to take photos of his door. They thought I'd gone absolutely mad. But to me, I thought, is it real? You know, is it real? So of course, when the photos came back and it was as clear as anything, I thought, yeah, it's not my imagination. Because um, LSD screws your brains up. Mm. You know, later on I got massive feeling because my doctor was trying to stick me in rehab for years as well because of the state of me, but I wouldn't go. The main reason I wouldn't go is because if they started opening up <laughs> my my psychology, <laughs> I think they would never have let me out, especially voices telling me to kill people and all that, yeah. you know, so, yeah, so I carried them everywhere and I kept thinking about this Jesus, but it never dawned on me to go to church or read the Bible, yeah. Yeah. so I was just thinking, Jesus, who are you? So, shall I say how I ended up coming to church? Please do. Okay. During this time, uh, and this was a matter of weeks, my grandmother suddenly had a heart attack and died. So I find myself at a funeral service. So I'm in a, a chapel kind of church. How was your relationship with your grandmother? Can you just give us a sense of what that was like? Uh, we lived with my grandmother off and on. Right. Uh, because of family breakdown. 
Yeah. So pretty close. Um, not a Christian at all. Uh, yeah. Although the night she had a heart attack, I was on my way to get uh, some gear, some drugs. Yeah. So I was still doing marijuana. Okay. While this is going on, and I walked past her house and saw an ambulance because my friend lived quite near her to be council estate on Darford, uh, the tree estate. So I had to go through one road to get to another, and there was an ambulance, and there was the drugs, and I thought, what do I do? Yeah. And I actually made the choice to go to her house, and it was difficult. Mm. You know, it was quite a difficult choice. So, anyway, I went in, she was rushed off, and I'm glad I did go in, because she died just a few days later. So, at her funeral, um, there was a vicar there, and... He was just talking and I was pretty switched off and what got me, I didn't have any emotions then either. So even though I would have been upset, I couldn't demonstrate that. I had no tears, I couldn't cry. I was actually observing people crying, but then I was totally shut down really within my emotions. And um, then it was like the vicar started talking to me personally. It's almost like the, the uh, loudspeakers came up and he said, you can only come to God as you are. I thought, you're joking, I'm the problem. Even, you know, even for someone like you? Yeah, yeah. I thought, like this? Yeah. Oh, surely I've got to get rid of this and then yeah. come to God. And he said, you can come no other way. And I thought, but if God found out what I'm like, <laughs> or if he knows, how can I come to God like this? Mm. But anyway, it caused me another dilemma. That's all I heard from what he said. And then my mum turned around, and out of the blue she said, you're thinking of going to church, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I am. And she said, let me take you. So, of course, because all I, I thought all churches were the same as Roman Catholic churches, I didn't realise that you had different denominations or anything like that. I was so unchurched. Right. So I got in touch with the church that we were assigned to, the church that I was christened in. Got in touch with that one. It's uh, St. Columbus in Dartford. Okay. So I phoned them up, uh, spoke to a man called Father Canaan and said, I need to talk to someone, I'm thinking of coming to church. So he made an appointment to see me. And when I met with him, my mum dropped me off and I went in and it was weird. Um, when I got there, just seeing him, seeing also what was going on, I felt very unsafe being alone for, with people, mm -hmm. but unsafe for them. Because I still had this tension of these voices telling me to kill people. Brought on by the narcotics. Yeah. yeah, or even the occult things that I was involved in. Yeah. Like, I couldn't tell what was demonic, I couldn't tell what was psychotic, because yeah. the symptoms are the same. You know, and I was such a mixed bag of them, I couldn't tell you what was what. So I'm alone with Father Canaan, we're talking about stuff, and I'm thinking I've got to make this short and sweet, because I'm now feeling very unsafe for you. But he suggested some things. Um, one thing that he did, I've actually caught up with him recently and thanked him for what he did. He put my path on good foundations. He gave me a Bible and said, read that. So I took it away and I read it. Oh, I read it. <laughs> he said, start in the New Testament. I didn't. I started from Genesis. I just read right the way through and then had to keep reading right the way through. But that was difficult. See, when I first opened the Bible and looked at it, all the words were curse words. There was something going on in there. I was like shocked and then I had to really focus and battle against something that was going on. Eventually, you know, it, it made sense, but reading the Old Testament, everything I read condemned me. Right. Right. You know, there's laws against this, laws against that, there's even laws against tattooing your body. Yeah. And I was like, God, I couldn't even get that right. <laughs> totally. So what made you persevere with it? Um, this book was... Uh... Fear. I was still under the complete conviction that I was going to hell, yeah. but somehow this Jesus was the answer. I'd love to say overnight the love of God hit me and I changed. No, it was fear. Um, Do you believe it can happen that way though? Oh, something. for many people. Yeah, my brother-in-law was a hell's angel and one night Jesus appeared to him in a dream. He saw the love of God. Changed overnight. Whereas with you, it's certainly like, no, it was, an it was a process rather than a, yeah, an event. Yeah, it, it was a process that went on for years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And looking back, the only way I could say I made it is Jesus was good with it. I'll, I'll talk about a conclusion in that in a minute, but mm. yeah, Father Canaan suggested that I start going to church. So I tried. And the first night, so it's up on West Hill in Dartford. If anyone knows the old Dartford, you've got West Hill, which is literally on the London side of Dartford, Crowford's the next town, and it's literally just near there. And then you've got the town centre, it's probably two miles. There was in Lowell Street a pub called The Plough. 
So I walked into this church building. Going in there, there was like an inner force that wanted to keep me out. Mm. I was like in there and I stood at the back, sweating, looking most uncomfortable, I know that. And I, I just found it so difficult to stay in there. In the end, my head, it felt like someone had kicked a hornet's nest and I ran. I just had to get out and I ran literally from that side of Dartford to the plow. It was a Sunday night, obviously, so I ran straight into the pub, ran straight into the toilets, and I was being violently sick, absolutely throwing up. An old friend of mine walked in, and uh, I'll call him Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> He's walked in and he said, you all right, Glenn? I went, obviously not. He said, where you been? I said, church. He laughed, he thought I was being sarcastic. He said, well, obviously you ain't doing your own good, is it? I mean, yeah. no, not at the moment. <laughs> and, but anyway, this same Adrian, later on when I get free of all that, he turned around and said, you still doing that church stuff? I said, yeah. He said, you? I said, yeah. He said, not you. He said, anyone else can be a Christian, but not you. I went, well, I am. And he turned around and he ran, and I never saw him again. Wow. Yeah, so it took me six attempts to be able to stay in the church service. It was like all hell was let loose in my mind to force me out of there, but I just stood at the back. The thing that kept me going was fear. I was too scared to stay away, but then again, I was too scared not to go. <laughs> yeah, it was like, if I can't get through this, I'm going to hell. So what do you think kept you there on the six occasions then? Because that sounds like the, um, that, that sounded like your, your, your ticket to continue going in. Yeah, I heard, <coughs> Excuse me, quick drink of water. Yeah, sure. I heard my first gospel message. Uh, Father Ganon was preaching that night. Um, and so he was preaching on a story called The Prodigal Son. I don't know if you've ever heard yes, that. Yes, That was really for me. Because <laughs> it's a story about a man, uh, a son who says to his dad, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance now. And then goes out and squanders everything on reckless living. You know, parties prostitutes, the whole lot. And I thought, yeah, like, many of my old friends were prostitutes. Uh, no, it's an embarrassing story about that. <laughs> That's another one, not for today. Um, yeah, so, you know, it was, I could, uh, yeah, I, I could see in this prodigal son some similarities with me. Yeah. So I'm listening, thinking, you've got my attention. But then Father Canaan brings it to the closure, and he says, um, when the son returned, and came back because the father was looking out for him all the time you know when the father saw him at a distance yeah. he ran off puts his arms around him and embraces him and says you were dead now you're alive yeah. and they had a celebration and i thought hang on he hasn't had a chance to repent yet he hasn't had a chance to say i'm sorry yet and the father gives him his signet ring and puts his cloak on him and there's rejoicing then father can said this is how god treats all sinners who come back to him mm -hmm. And I thought, you've got to be joking. You've got to be joking. Look at what I've done. Look at my life. Look at, how can you embrace me? So did that, from that point on, did you then feel accepted? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. We'll get into that. Then. Not yet, yeah. Um, so what was it then that actually made you feel accepted by God then? That was a process. You see, uh, I became, from that point on, extremely religious. I set out to prove to God how sorry I was. Yeah and to live a life of penitence. You know, I, I kind of thought, if I can show God, I'm sorry. So, I did, through God's help, lose all my friends, because I'd stopped all the hard drugs immediately. Um, that's not to say that the symptoms stopped. I was still getting LSD flashbacks two years after I touched LSD. You know, my brains were fried. Rushed. Yeah, yeah, completely. So, yeah, I, but I cut myself off from the world as much as possible. Although every now and then I'd have to go out. And every time I went out, I'd end up smoking cannabis. You know, just to try and alleviate what was going on. So I was kind of in a real dilemma. Then one night, after three months of not touching everything, I went down to the plough again. An old friend of mine who shares the first name with me, who was murdered now about six years ago, he turned around to me and said, Glenn, you, I've heard you've not done any gear for three months. I went, you're right. I thought, how do you know? <laughs> Anyway, he said, you deserve this, and passed me a huge joint. And I thought, you know what, I do deserve that. But as I went to touch it and grab it, I suddenly had this download from God, and it was like, what do you think you're doing? And I thought, he said, this is what's destroyed you. Now you're telling these it's okay. And I felt God say, repent. 
So in my head, I went, oh, God, I'll go home and repent. And then I felt God say, why? Why go home? Mm. I thought, because I'm in a pub with all my friends, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then I felt God say, who do you fear, me or them? And my life was dominated by fear then. And I said to God, both. <laughs> they were not nice people. Yeah. And then I felt God say, well, who do you fear more? Them or me? Who do you want to go on with? Me or them? I said, you, Lord. He said, repent now. So I did. I got on my knees in that pub and just said, sorry to God. In front of all these friends? Yeah, I had no choice. <laughs> Again, conviction of sin. Wow. Uh, I, I just felt, I just want to be right with God. That was a brave yeah. thing to do, wasn't no, it? Um, no, don't it say it was no. no, it was fear motivated. Well, well, I did it, so I suppose you could say it was brave. Yeah. I suppose, yeah, bravery isn't the absence of fear, is it? But, yeah, but I wanted, I feared God more than what I feared people. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, it's God I've got to face in judgment, not them. So, yeah, all I can say is my relationship with them was severed that night. <laughs> I had to quickly exit the pub, and they were not shouting words of encouragement up the street as I went over. I suspect not. <laughs> I suspect not. No, so it's a point of no return. But it did me the world of good. Yeah. You know, that was severed, so there was me and God from now on. So I threw myself into Catholicism. Um, I was at church, because it's open. It was, well then, it was open nearly 24 seven. And we're talking about the building now. The building, yeah. So I would be in the building, yeah. praying. Uh, at night, I'd be in there again, uh, just trying to find peace. You know, there was still this battle going on. On and on and on and on. Eventually, I even had a patron saint that I found called Saint Drew Thaddeus, the patron saint of hopeless cases and things despaired of. Yeah. That was my self-image. <laughs> yeah. Hopeless case, despaired, absolutely despaired of. Because I felt, well, probably I'm not worthy enough to go through Jesus, so I need someone to do it for me. It's before I understood the gospel. So what was a major challenge? What took me from that to the next level? Yeah. This was just over a year later from the experience in the field when I cried out. And then the door, so a year later, still plagued with LSD flashbacks. Now- Even though you hadn't used LSD for about, what, 10 months now? Yeah, because... easily, yeah, easily. I couldn't tell what was demonic. I couldn't tell what was drug damage. I couldn't tell was just mental health problems. I just couldn't tell. All I know is my head was constantly hot. I was in constant turmoil and constant anxiety. It's where I lived. Then, so I'm up in my room, praying, reading the Bible as usual, trying to find peace. And this time it was an audible voice. I heard it. And this voice said, if you pray with iniquity in your heart, which is wickedness, God does not hear you. Does not hear your prayer. Yeah, that's in the Bible. It's yeah. a verse that's in yeah. the Bible. And then this voice said, do you really think God listens to you? Come on. You know yourself. Look at your heart. Of course. Quick examination, I used to live for girls, the desire was still in there. I used to live for drugs. Although I weren't doing these things now, the desire was still in there. Mm. You know, so this voice said, I know the real you and so do you. God does not listen to you. You're lost. I lost. That night I lost. I realised, yeah, okay, if God doesn't hear me, what's the point of fighting? What's the point of going on? I realised I was living in hell, I might as well just go there. Yeah, that's literally what my life was. So what happened then, Glenn? I got a knife out of my bedroom drawer, put it in my pocket, went downstairs, my mum was downstairs. She looked at me, she said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I just need to get some fresh air and wire. She went, look in the mirror. And when I looked there, I had these huge welts, red, purple welts, all over my face. And it was anxiety, because I, I was going to go and kill myself. You know, I just couldn't go on. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I, I really kept the family out of all this. Yeah. I was alone with it. So I went off to the school field where I heard the voice a year ago, you know, or more. And I just offered up a quick prayer. I went, God, I'm sorry. I tried. I can't do it. Well, you're here today, thank goodness. Uh, well, or praise Lord. But it's because was, of what happened. What was it that yeah. stopped you doing the unthinkable that night then? Right. What happened? <laughs> what happened? The person who did this doesn't even know it yet. But when I get to heaven and they'll be there, I'm gonna thank them for it. See, it's a secular school, secular university. It's not Christian, it's not church. 
So there I was alone in the school field with a knife in my pocket, but there was a light on in the building, this building over to my right. So I walked over there because this was not a cry for help. Nobody could help me. You know, the police, what could they do? And so I told you. You're in the middle of the field, so no one's going to hear you. <laughs> no, so, you know, so I didn't want a botched suicide attempt. I didn't want to be found. The last thing I wanted was, well, I can't even kill myself properly. Mm. You know, I felt failure enough. So I walked over to the window with this light on to make sure there was no one in there. <laughs> there was a tripod with a poster on it and this light shining on it. So remember, this is not a church. I read this notice on this tripod and it said, and know this, I am with you always, yeah. even to the very end of the age. Yeah. Again, that's what Jesus said to his wow. disciples. Wow. I just felt God say, I'm with you. How powerful is yeah, that? Yeah, oh, very. You see, what the devil had set up as a well of despair for me was actually a well of faith. Yeah. God allowed it. Sometimes we go into situations where we think there's no way out. And we think, God set it up so that we can know him on the more. See, life's not been easy since then. It's been different. Yeah. But whenever I'm faced with impossible situations, I go back to that time and find strength. Yeah. That must have been the lowest point in your life. It was. <laughs> this is 30... About 34 years ago now. Yeah. And yet here I am because of that. I, I don't know. Why was the light on? Someone had obviously forgot to turn it off. Why was there scripture in a secular college? And what do you think the answer to those questions are now? God set it up. He's sovereign over everything. Absolutely is. Yeah. Set it up for me. Yeah. 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 He even set up the prodigal son being preached. Just for me. Actually, because I preach a lot now. It's a passion of mine. And sometimes I've had this on quite a lot of um, occurrences where I just know a whole sermon is set up for one person yeah. and I'll say it. Yeah. And I've known often in those situations someone come up to me afterwards and say, that was just for me, and they give their lives to Christ. So if I could um, push that fast forward button now. Yeah. So, you know, you got to that, you got to that point um, where you could have done the unthinkable, but you, yeah. were, you were saved and from that. It turned um, from despair to glory, like that, yeah. Great. Yeah. So, so what took you into being who you are now? Because you are Pastor Glenn at yeah. the Barney Evangelical Church in Sutherland. So. Again, that, that, yeah. it's always a journey with yeah. me, always a journey. Mm. When I was reading the Bible, one of many times, I got to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and there's a bit in there about Isaiah's call. And God says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, send me, O Lord. Um, that's as far as I could get. I spent the rest of that night praying that semicolon. Send me. I'll go anywhere. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Send me. I just wanted to give my life for the yeah. kingdom of God. So originally, I was going to become a Catholic priest. This was when I was still a Catholic. Okay. So I went to see Father Canaan. He'd been discipling me for about a year. We met weekly. We, I did all the stuff that you're supposed to do because I never bothered as a child. You know, I got... Um, Confirmed. So I took my first communion. I did all that in my early twenties, very early twenties. Oh dear, yes. Yeah, so all that was going on, and uh, that passion just to serve God, to give my life for Him, wouldn't go away. Yeah. I used to spend all my time. I was then working on a sewage farm as well. You know, it's the only job I could get. It's not the bottom, way way up. <laughs> and even then, I was there for the people. You know, I was making up sermons for them all the time. It was a real passion, and. The reason I didn't end up a Roman Catholic is six weeks before I really had to make that decision to go away and study and disappear from the world, one old friend turned up, a real good friend of mine who I hadn't seen for years, and he said, I found out you're going to do this. I don't know how people pick up this stuff, but he, he knew I was going to go away. He said, have a farewell drink with me. Right. I said, okay. I said, but I won't go to Dartford, because I knew too many people. I remember saying this, and I will not go in the Bull and Vic. Again, it used to be a pub that ideally, you know, so people would come to me still expecting stuff, even though this was years later. It's quite notorious. Um, he lost his car keys. There we are in Dartford. There we are in the Bull and Vic. And I'm thinking, I wasn't going to come in here, but here I am. What am I doing in here? I had the photos of the door with the face of Jesus on it. It came everywhere in those days. Yeah. I was an evangelistic Catholic. <laughs> and I noticed there was um, two blonde girls and an old friend of mine who I hadn't seen for years. And one of these blonde girls, quite stunning actually, kept staring at me. And I thought, 
you know, you're lovely, but I'm going to be a Catholic priest, celibacy and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's not on my mind. But then I had a real compulsion to go and talk to my old friend Kevin about what God's doing in my life. I just had to. So anyway, I walked over there. I've got the photos on the door, you know, I'm showing them, and they're like, yeah, I can see it, you know, you can, it did look like the face of Jesus, it was there, it was in the grain of wood, clear power. Anyway, one of these girls turned around to me and said, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a Catholic. And she said, yeah, but are you a Christian? And I thought, what's wrong with you? Yeah, I'm a Catholic. And she said, yeah, but are you a proper Christian? And I thought, what is wrong with you? You know, am I not talking English? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm a Catholic, I'm a Christian. Anyway, uh, to cut a long story short, suddenly I found other people who believed in God my age. And they invited me to their church, I invited them to mine. So I went off to their church. Weird. They had a band that played music. Yeah. There were people dancing. There were blokes trying to hug me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I walked out. I thought, this is some weird cult, I'm not into that. Yeah. They came to my church, and this girl, Sarah, she said, uh, why do you come here, it's so boring. I said, because this is real church. <laughs> anyway, again, to cut a long story short, uh, we became very good friends, and there was a gravitation. All I can say is, the church that they took me to, when people were singing, worshipping, I was getting this euphoric feeling, absolutely euphoric that felt very similar to heroin. It was the same rush, that, whoa, I like right. this. Now, I went up to the pastor at the end of one of their services and said, when you got sing, I'm getting heroin rushes. Mm. What is it? He said, what are you doing in my church? <laughs> I said, I'm not doing heroin. <laughs> but it's, it's that feeling, what's going on? Well, at least he didn't call the police. <laughs> no, <I'm not laughs> Well, yeah, well, when Sarah said that, oh, no, I'll get on to that in a minute. Um, yeah, so he said, it's the Holy Spirit. And then tell me more. And he said, it's all in the Bible. Read it. So, of course, that was the flag. Mm. If it's in there, I'm going to find it. Yeah. And it was. So then there's a gravitational thought process going on. You know, remember, it took me a lot to get in the Catholic Church. I wasn't going to leave overnight. Fear got me in there. But then there was this life. And it was scriptural. Mm. And I was already questioning many practices of the Catholic Church. As much as I, there's treasure there, you know, I'm not anti Roman Catholic, but God called me out of it, yeah. clearly. So I'm looking, well, that's in the Bible, that's the foundation. So, therefore, so I'm going that way. Also, with me and Sarah, we were very good friends. Um, then it turned out into more than a friendship. And how that happened, this is totally unromantic. We went to her friend's wedding, okay. and on the way back, I'm chatting with her, and then I just out of the blue said, so when we get married, <laughs> <laughs> she told me, it was October the 10th, 34 years ago, anyway, she turned around to me and said, oh, we're going to get married, are we? You know, <laughs> I said, oh, so I said, Seems like a good idea to me. It what doesn't happen like that in the films, does no, it? No, yeah. She went, yeah, okay. <laughs> but then she, a little while after that, she said, do you remember the night we met in this pub? Yeah. The pub that I said I wasn't going in. She said what happened to her that night and why she was staring at me. And what did happen to her? Right. Her um, sister, Diane, yeah. was going out with my old friend Kevin. Okay. Sarah and her sister had become Christians six weeks prior to this at a communion service. Basically, Sarah said, they would pass the bread and the wine. As the bread came to her, she looked at it and she realised this is true. Yeah. And just had an overwhelming experience of God. For her, it was that easy. From not being a Christian, not believing anything, to knowing it as well. She becomes a Christian, her lifestyle changes. She's looking at all the boys in church. Di and her sister's going out with Kevin, they're both doing church together. Sarah said there wasn't any boys in the church that she could relate to. So that night, Kevin and Diana going out, they said to Sarah, come with us. She said, no, I don't want to be third party, you know. And they went, well, pray for a boyfriend then. And she said, can you do that? <laughs> they went, well, let's do it. So they did. They prayed that she'd find a Christian boyfriend. Right. And off they went down to the pub to meet him. <laughs> anyway, seek first the kingdom of God and all this will work out. Yeah, so I'm thinking celibate Catholicism. She said, when I walked in the pub, she looked over, and she heard God say to her, 
you're going to marry him. This complete stranger. So of course she stared at me. Wow. So then, before she knows it, I'm talking to her. That's why she kept saying that you're a Christian. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, so, you know, of course, if she'd have told me that night, I would have gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it took a little while. We was married within a year of knowing each other. You know, we just know God brought us together for a reason, to walk to together. So that yeah. sounds like it's been a, sort of like a, a two-stage process in a way. You were introduced to God through Catholicism. Yeah. Um, and then you jumped over the fence into, um, into a different... A different flavour. A different flavour of Christianity. Yeah. Yeah, which is where I came alive. Now, one of the um, highlights of it... See, I was confirmed a Catholic, and at this point I was going to both churches. So I'm reading uh, Pentecost, I'm reading Holy Spirit activity. Mm. So I said to Father Canaan, why should I get confirmed? What's that? He said, well, it's when you receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I went, like Pentecost. Yeah. See, I was thinking Bible, not tradition. So he said something like that. And he said, and a bishop will come and do it. I said, what's a bishop? I can't find that in the Bible. He said, it's the same word used for apostle. So I said, there's an apostle coming to lay hands on me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, something like that. Yeah. Well, I couldn't resist that, could I? Yeah. So there I was. All these kids and me in my twenties strolling down. <laughs> anyway, all I can remember is the bishop put his hands on me, said something about Domestos, put some oil on my head and sent me back to the pier. Yeah. Yeah. And I got back and I thought, God... You're not here. Where in the other church, I'm getting these euphoric experiences. And then there was, um, he was the leader of the Vineyard Church, a man called John Wimber. He had what he called the Power Team. And they were doing a tour with the United Kingdom. So I went off to this church in Sidcup. So there was his team praying for people. There were people getting healed and all sorts going on. I still had problems. Even then, I still had Moments where I just wouldn't feel safe with people alone. I still had these... Do you think this was the flashbacks from the... Uh, from the it drugs? was both. There was flashbacks. Absolutely clearly flashbacks. Uh, I ended up in a cartoon world for three days, where everyone just looked like cartoons. Um, when I was working, I had my supervisor melt on me. And all I'd have to do is say to myself, this does not happen. Mm. I'm seeing it, I'm perceiving it, but this does not happen. So somehow, in this mad turmoil, I don't know how I was keeping it together, but I was functioning. Yeah. So with all this going on, I was always exhausted, always. But anyway, I thought, I've got to get this sorted out. I also would have absolute feelings of condemnation come over me as well. You know, I thought, I must have lost the Holy Spirit or something. You know, that's what I used to think. But the devil is a rejected being, so he knows how to make you feel rejected. Yeah. And they would just come on me. Anyway, it was a lot of turmoil going on, so this power team, I went up to one of them and said, look, this is what I've come through. This is what I'm going through. I need prayer. And he said, we'll pray for you at the end. We like to save the difficult ones till last. <laughs> oh, <great. laughs> anyway, this was, this was pivotal, honestly. So I'm still carrying so much stuff. Um, even though I've come from Catholicism to... I'd say, call me Protestant if you want, I don't care, but I'm Christian. That's what I call myself. And I go by what the Bible says. Um, so there I am, they took me into this room at the end of the service, sat me down in a chair, started praying for me, and then I remember he was uh, an American cop, a big black guy, massive guy, and I'm looking at him. And then he said, look, I'm just going to pray for you. I just want to see if there's anything demonic going on with you. Are you okay with that? I said, yeah, I'm okay with that. And then he just looked me in the eyes and said, look at me. And I just looked away from him. I thought, I can't look at him. And I'm like, and he said, it, look at me. And I started growling at him. And I thought, this ain't normal. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. And then he said, in the name of Jesus, look at me. And I'm just transfixed. We're just eye to eye. And then it, it was like he got my life diary out. And he said, you was into this, you was into that. You did this, you did that. And, and I'm like, how on earth does he know all this? Yeah. And he said, are you sorry about that? I said, absolutely. He said, you repent of that? I said, yeah. And every time he did that, and I said, yes, and he said, God forgives you, it felt like someone had plugged me into the mains. I'm like, whoa, and I'm really shaking. I could just feel like electricity going through me. Then my face went numb. It felt like, you know, you go to the dentist. So I'm laying there, and I couldn't hold my head up. I was so, anyway, I said, can someone, so one of them holding my head up, all this going on, these voices seemed to shout that had been there, 
And, you know, the things, I wanted to kill him. There was this rage in me that wanted to kill him. And then these voices said, they're just about to cast you out. We're not the demons, you are. You're the one who did all this wrong. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> absolute panic. And then calm. The Holy Spirit just came in and Jesus said, you're mine. Nothing can snatch you out of my hands. You're mine. And all I can say is I was delivered. And one of the side effects of that deliverance was my mind was restored 99%. So 99. My short-term memory is still ain't that good. <laughs> Not as bad. I'd actually, people had asked me what television I so, would be watching, I wouldn't have a clue. Glenn, do you, <laughs> would you sort of like say at that point that was the, the end of your journey of becoming a Christian then, or does it not? I'd say I was already like a Christian. The moment I accepted Jesus Christ as my saviour, I was a Christian and saved. Mm. The lots of, you know, the, the rest of it is, the Bible talks about just the journey wasn't an easy one. I think some people might say, well, as soon as I become a Christian, you know, everything's going to be okay, and uh, I'll understand. The journey's still not an easy one. Yeah. It's different, different. Um, Jesus never promised us easy life. Yeah. Actually, he said, hard times you're guaranteed. Yeah. But I will be with you through them all. That was his promise. Okay. So when I went that night, I was going to end my life. He was with me. He's always with us. That's that's the promise. Yeah. Not not prosperity. Not an easy life. Yeah. His promise is his very self. Well, I'll well, have him. <laughs> that that is one power. I think everyone would agree that's one powerful story that we've heard from you. So thank you so much oh, for that. My pleasure. Um, let, let's just let's just. Be frank, there might be some people watching now um, who might be in a similar position to yourself or, or something that's really um, been challenging to them, is really getting them down. Uh, what's your message to them? What, 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 what could you sort of like say to them to restore a bit of their hope that might be in short supply at the moment? Can you give them some hope? What would you say to them? Um, hope. My hope is found in Jesus, honestly. He loved me that much he died for me. He exchanged all my sin for his righteousness. And although life can be hard, although we sometimes have to go through many valleys, the valleys do lead to the mountains. It won't always be like it is now. Life is full of many different seasons, but there's one guarantee, no matter what season you're in, once you have Jesus Christ as your personal saviour, he's the good shepherd. He will be with you, always. He will be your ever-present help in times of need. He will put purpose to your life, give you destiny, give you identity, and give you hope. See, Jesus said, then whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. And he does turn our morning into joy. How? Only he can do it. I never thought I'd be living the life I live. I've got six daughters and 11 grandchildren. My life is full. Not easy. Still, we have many things we have to go through. But I know he is for me, not against me. And I know he loves me completely. And he does you too. Amen. Pastor Glenn, thank you very much indeed. So it's a goodbye from us all here at Vine Evangelical Church here in Seven Oaks. Um, if you do want to get in contact with us, there's a screen that's going up after the end of this show and um, please do get in contact using the contact details on the, on the slide. Thank you for watching and um, I wish you all peace. Thank you. Thank you Ian. <laughs>